It is Easter Sunday at New Life Covenant Church. It's Resurrection Sunday at New Life Covenant Church. And if you wonder what this church is about, I'm just going to read to you one scripture. We read it all the time. It's Psalms 27, 13. David is in a place where he is in a press. Anybody experienced that in the last couple of years where you just feel like, man, the world is against me and this is not easy. And maybe I'll even want to, like, I, I want to do something different. Um, and you, if, you, if you're in that place, that's where David was. And David declared this as his approach to God. You know, it, well, this isn't a place of religion. If it is, we've got to change some things. You weren't drugged. If, 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 if you were drugged to church this morning, you weren't drugged to church to a place of religion. You're, you were brought into a place where people know Jesus and they want to introduce him to you. Religion tries to get you wrapped up in what you should do. Relationship with Jesus first recognizes what he's done for you and everything else comes after that. And so David in this place shares, shares his wisdom and we've kind of positioned our hearts dead set on seeing a living God. We're not just gonna worship a God that we'll one day see in the by and by, but we get to have a relationship with him right now. David said this, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord right here, right now. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We are pursuing a right here, right now relationship with Jesus Christ, that we can hear his voice, that we can be encouraged from heaven, that, we, that God has a plan for us and it's, he's not hiding that from us, but we get to walk that plan out. And if you're in a place where you're like, man, I've just really screwed it up, been there, still there sometimes, but I'll tell you the Holy Spirit is really good at bringing you back into a place of God's goodness. And so we just have to, if you're like, I'm not interested in religion and you're sitting next to somebody who brought you or, what, or maybe you came because it's Easter Sunday and you just feel like, you know, I, this is where I'm supposed to be on an Easter Sunday, I wanna remind you that this is not a place of religion, it's a place of relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today we're not talking just about Jesus who gave his life for you, we're not talking about Jesus who was crucified, but if that's all we talked about, it'd be really powerful, but it'd lack the reality of he is a risen savior. He's not a good, he's not a good teacher that once was, he's a risen savior that is right now present with you if you only believe. Before we start talking about the Easter story that you've heard so many times, and I, I, I wanna remind you when we talk about Jesus, who we're talking about. You guys okay with that? So turn to Revelation. How many been to an Easter service and they, oh, we're gonna get there. <laughs> Revelation chapter one, verse 17 says, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am, this is Jesus, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive ever forever, amen. And I have the keys to Hades and death. He says, said, don't behold me as a, somebody weak still up on that cross. Don't behold me as somebody who's who, who, who's too kind to speak the truth or somebody who's too soft to, to, to but recognize this, I was dead, but I am uh, more alive than ever before. And while I was fighting for you, I brought back the victory that was, uh, that, that was held over you. I, brought, I paid the price and brought back, who we're talking about here is not just Jesus. I want you to position him, not just as Jesus, the religious picture you've seen, but in order to see the true story of the resurrection of Christ, you have to position him to be Jesus the victorious. Peter says it in Acts chapter two, he says, Peter continued, and this is Peter speaking after he's seen Jesus, after Jesus has come back, he's seen Jesus resurrected and Jesus has commissioned him and Jesus says this, people of Israel, listen to the facts, Jesus the victorious was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven for you know how God performed many powerful miracles and signs through him. This morning, we're gonna talk about Jesus the victorious. So put aside your Jesus the religious and let's look at what God is really doing. Can we do that? I believe that Jesus can be victorious in your marriage this morning. We're talking about a resurrected savior. Today, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and because of his resurrection, 
today, dead things in your life can be resurrected too. You can have a resurrection moment. Your marriage can be resurrected. Your addictions can be broken. Your life can be changed. Your purpose can be found and you can recognize that you're a person of significance. You can be healed because he took your burdens and he took your sickness. Your family can be saved and you can be filled with hope and filled with joy. All because of Jesus was resurrected. If you're wondering, can God, will God do this for me? The answer is a clear yes, he'll do it for you this morning. Will you, let's just start in prayer. Will you guys open up your arms? He said, oh, open up my arms. Yeah, just, just as wide as you can. Just, if you're expecting something small from Jesus today, then open them up a little bit. If you're expecting something big, then just get a little rude and knock somebody over like it's Christmas Sunday. And just repeat after me. Just say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. Now, put, put it on your heart and apologize to the person that you just punched with your elbow. Just say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. Father, your love and everything you have for me, I welcome it this morning. In Jesus' name. This morning on the way to church, I um, actually, as I was walking through the halls, anybody get family photos? Any, uh, get cinnamon rolls? get a foo-foo-y pink. Does anybody drink coffee this morning? Uh, as I was walking through the halls and, and early this morning, I got to stop by uh, kids area and the Orbaugh family was in there and I, I was, they were sharing with me about their morning and they said, there's Easter eggs. And they were talking to, and, and you know, I'm trying to be funny with them and I, they're not paying any attention to me. And I just said, I said, you know, bunnies don't lay eggs. And Elijah so quickly without even looking up goes, yeah, they hide them. I don't know what your problem is. Yeah, bunnies don't lay eggs, they hide them. And Easter should be an incredible day in your family. It's not just a, a, a day to come to church, but uh, a pastor kid had trained t his daughter, Tiffany, well when he said this should be the most important day of the whole year. Because without the resurrection of Jesus, it's all changed for us. But because of the, it's, it's, it, this should be a day bigger than Christmas. Because the birth of Jesus is a big thing, but the follow through of Jesus to the end to bring victory in our lives should not be minimized or marginalized to just a church service. It shouldn't just be the day that we wear button ups when we usually wear t-shirts. <laughs> it should be the day, it, 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 there, should be a, there should be a celebration around this but because he has risen, we have life and life more abundantly. Our kids woke up this morning to these huge Easter baskets full of stuff. And I'm telling you, Legos, like Tiff, last night she's like, look, this is like, this is incredible. And she's looking at the masterpiece she's put together and I probably should have doted on it more, but the kids, get, but I want, I want you to understand when you celebrate and you don't like worry about the religion part of it, and it's like, oh, I did this or embark at him, but instead you just celebrate all aspects and make sure you point him to Jesus. There was candy in there. There was Legos in there. There was a Spider-Man in there. But I'll tell you, the thing he came to church was, was this, an illustrated Bible that Tiff put in there. The thing he wanted to bring with him, the thing that our five-year-old grabbed a hold of the most is the word of God that was given to him this morning. And so however you celebrate, and if you don't have a basket, it's time to go, guess, I, I got good news for you. Tomorrow they're 50% off. <laughs> and it is not too late to celebrate. That should be like a song. It's never too late to celebrate. Um, okay, let's open up our Bibles. Uh, I'm going to, this, this morning as we talk about Easter, I want to just, we're going to go through the Easter story and, and you know, it's, it's, if you think about, you've, anybody had a bad week before, like things just didn't go well. I've had a couple in my life where things just like, man, that just, I could use a mulligan on that one. I could use 
and sometimes it's a bad month and sometimes it's a bad year. And I just want to imagine, can you imagine the kind of week that Jesus was having leading up to the resurrection? Can you imagine the, 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 the pain he was going through? Jesus suffered a whole lot of things that would have knocked us out. Jesus went through and he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. That enough would knock you, that alone could bring grief to your heart in such an incredible way. He was apprehended like a criminal in the middle of the night and yet he still did miracles for those that were apprehending him. He was beaten and humiliated and falsely accused. He was mocked when, as the king of the Jews and they made a crown of thorns and they pierced his brow, pushed it into his skull. He was prosecuted by the Roman rulers and even though he was found innocent, he took the place of a murderer. I didn't organize my notes from last week or last service. Jesus was sentenced to death by the ones he came to save, by the people he loved. He was beaten with 39 lashes. He carried our cross. He, carried our, he was crucified for our sins. He was kept silent and he was, as he was verbally abused. And they mocked him for his purpose. He was tortured on the cross and he endured our sins even through though he was sinless. And then he experienced separation from God. Jesus went through all of this leading up to the resurrection. It's said that actually when he was in the prayer garden the night before, the, the, the night before this all took place, when he was praying, it says that at that point the agony was so much that Luke noticed that he was sweating blood, that he was being torn apart and he's, at, he's crying out to the Father for help to walk this through. And he hasn't even really been apprehended. It hasn't really even started yet. And so I just want to go through a little bit of this because I think there's power in recognizing their perspective. You've heard the Easter story before. You've heard about the price that Jesus paid. You've heard about the sins that, of the world that he carried. But I just want to stop because there's some moments in here that if you're not careful, you'll miss. And they're powerful moments. So in Luke chapter 22... Verse 47, anybody read a, ever read a chapter that has 47? You, you, you get like, I'm going to read the whole Bible. And then you read a chapter and you're like, man, this one is really long. <laughs> Verse 47 says this, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, uh, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the 12 went before them and he drew near and he kissed him. But Jesus said to Judas, why, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? And what's happening in this is Jesus gets up and he said, okay, the betrayer's close. And Judas comes in and Judas says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'll identify Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus basically says, do what you're gonna do. Jesus allows, I'm telling you when, he know, when you know someone's betrayed you, it's hard to let them come close. But Jesus, even, even when his heart was full of hate and full of sin and full of self, Jesus allowed him to come close. Jesus is allowing you to come close no matter what your heart decision is. Whatever, no matter what your heart condition is, he'll allow, he'll allow you to come close. And, and in this moment, the disciples asked Jesus a question. Well, most of them did. They said, is this the time to pull up swords? Do we, like a multitude is approaching Jesus and they said, Shh, you want to fight? Like, can we? And, but there's one disciple that didn't wait and ask Jesus. There was one disciple, Peter, who pulls out his sword and he swipes off the ear of one of those who would dare touch Jesus. And Jesus, before he can respond to the disciples, he says, now's not the time for that. And he reaches and he heals the man's ear. Can you just imagine being the man who was sent to apprehend Jesus? Can you imagine being the one who had just betrayed Jesus? And you're witnessing, or can you just witness like, okay, it's on, and this guy loses his ear, and he's like, ow! I mean, probably more than that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to do it at the microphone. He, he probably lost his composure, and Jesus recomposed him, literally healing him, and then went with him as it, th he, this miracle worker, this, this savior who literally just 
put this man back together and now they're carrying him off so that he can be tormented and he can be humiliated. Jesus never stopped moving in power. If you go to verse 63, it says when the religious leaders got him in a room, hundreds of them gathered around him. And they decided to mock Jesus by, because, he, because of his claims. And so they blindfolded him and they beat him. They punched him. They took turns. And as they beat Jesus, then they mocked him and they said, so Jesus, if you are who you say you are, prophesy which one of us just hit you. And it hits me that Jesus actually, he's probably really good at this game. Jesus could have called them out one by one and then they lost their stuff. Like it could have stopped right there. But Jesus remained silent because he knew that he needed to endure the full thing because he wasn't going after just the room. He was going after everyone forever for all time. And so instead of, instead of showing them who he was, he kept silent for you. Because he could have saved a few, but he wanted to save them all. He was mocked as king of the Jews. He was led to Pilate and Pilate tries to find something wrong with this man that they brought him. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 24, or verse 13, it says, then Pilate, when he was called together with the chief priests, the rulers and the people, he said to them, you have brought, brought this man to me as one that misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in him, in this man concerning those who have accused him. Neither did Herod, because they sent him off to Herod. And, I, and he sent him back, and indeed, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him to you, for it's necessary to release the one, one of them to the feast. And they all cried. So the feast is going on, and at the feast, there's this moment of mercy in the Jewish culture where one who deserves to die is pardoned. And so Jesus is brought up, and he doesn't deserve to die. And Pilate says, well, you've brought somebody to me that obviously doesn't deserve to die. So there's no question the one who I should pardon is the one who you've accused. Because I can't find anything wrong with them. I sent him to Herod because I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And Herod can't find anything wrong with him. There's no reason we should crucify this man. And the Jewish people started crying out, give us Barabbas. Give us the murderer. Give us the one we know has committed sin, but cruci and, and he says, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? He says, crucify him. And they start chanting, crucify him. And I can imagine that they, they, they said the, ch the crowds got so loud that Pilate was concerned that there was gonna be a brawl, that there was gonna be a riot. And I can imagine that some of those people in that room, some of those people that were screaming, crucify him, were just passerbys. People who maybe just a week ago were screaming Hosanna because they heard everybody else screaming Hosanna as Jesus came into, the, came, came into the town and now they hear a different chant going on but because they're not discerning for themselves the situation that they're in, they're just going along with the crowd. They're chanting whatever the crowd chants because surely if that many people think that way, it must be right and so that man must be wrong and they should crucify him. But we have to be careful because Jesus has given us our own revelation. And if we just go along with it, we might miss out like these people did. We might miss out and crucify the wrong one. If you just go along with what the world's doing, you, you might miss out on what Jesus is doing in your life altogether. The crowd cried out at once saying, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who has been thrown into the prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called to them, but they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And then he said to them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the, the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave the sentence so that it, just as they requested. Pilate was, wasn't getting anywhere with these people. 
And so he gave in to the request. The Passion Translation says, verse 24, Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that the riot was developing, so he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And they yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. I can't help but think about how that declaration is still impacting people to this day. So Pilate released Barabbas to them and he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead whip tip, lead tip whip, and then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. You see, if we're not careful, we'll see Pilate as the bad guy in this situation. And Pilate wasn't somebody who even knew the Jewish customs. He was a ruler over over the Jewish people and his job was to see that justice was maintained. And as he evaluated Jesus, he could find no fault in him. As he evaluated Jesus, as he sat down and he asked him, he could see no reason to the point where he actually washed his hands. His wife had a dream and she had a dream of, uh, of, of Jesus and she said, you need to have nothing to do with this. And you know, and, and in collaboration with his wife and his, in obedience to what he had already felt, he, he said, listen, you guys want to crucify him. That's your thing. But I want to have nothing to do with this. You see, Pilate could see what the Jewish people couldn't, which was this man was a good man. And not only a good man, but he might just be exactly who he says he is. What if Jesus is who he says he is? What if we've judged him wrong. What if you've judged him as too weak and not victorious enough? What if you've judged him and you've went along with the world and because the world said, no, it's not, it's not real. It's a, it, and you've just chanted what the world chanted. But what if Jesus is who he says he is? Pilate started to see that he was. Jesus was sentenced to death by the ones he came to save, the very people he loved. Romans 5.8 says this, but God demonstrated his love towards us and while we were still sinners, and in this situation, why they were still chanting, crucify him, Jesus died for us. He was beaten with 39 lashes that, I, w- I wanna stop right there because 40 lashes is considered a death penalty. And so they wanted to go one less than that because they wanted to carry out. But actually, he wasn't to die by the whip. He was to die by the cross. And if you survived that 40th beating and you lived, the pain and suffering in which you would go through would be considered such agony that it would be worse than a death sentence. They were going to beat you 40, 40 times. It was going to grab the flesh off your back. There was literally nearly nothing left on his back. They stopped one lashing short so they could continue to to torment him. Because they didn't just want him dead, they wanted him defeated. But they didn't realize that this is Jesus the victorious. He carried our cross and he was crucified for our sins. He kept silent and all the way He kept silent all the way until he didn't. And if you're not careful, you'll look right over this part of the scripture or you'll just think, yeah, that's a time when he cried. But Jesus kept silent when he was beat. He kept silent when he was pummeled. He kept silent when the the, the crown was pressed into his flesh. There was a one moment where agony was so strong that he could no longer bear it. To me, that's a part of the scriptures I wanna read. To me, that's something I want to pay attention to. And so Jesus cries out to God when it's the most painful. And that's when he's carried our sins. And because the sin of the world is upon him, God turns his face from him because God cannot be with sin. We don't understand that fully because we live in a new and better covenant where we can go to God at any point when we believe. But before Jesus was resurrected, that was not possible. Sin had to be separated from God. And so Jesus cries out in Mark chapter 15, it it, it accounts for it. It says at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, my God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? I want you to understand that this isn't a man who's in his 30s. This is the eternal, part of the eternal Godhead. This is Jesus Christ who was there in the beginning when they had the idea to form man. When God said, hey, what if we make them in our image? And what if we give them the ability to reject us? He was there when sin entered the earth and he was there when Adam rejected the original plan. And he was there when the, he was there with everything. And all that time he was joined with God, joined with the Holy Spirit, three in one. But this mission required a moment to be alone. And he, he experienced the agony of being without the opportunity to be face to face with God without the opportunity, and he had to experience this so that you never would. We don't know. Whatever decision you've made about Jesus, you might be watching online, or, or, and, and, and it's just like, man, I'm just, whatever decision you've made about Jesus, you have the choice to have a relationship with him right now because of the sins that Jesus carried, because he endured separation for a little while so that we would never know that type of separation. This world is what this world is because that darkness cannot exist. And so Jesus cries out and he says, my Lord, my Lord, this is the moment of true anguish for him. This is the moment that he can't endure for very much longer. We all would have hit that point a whole lot. Some of us, some of you guys hit that point just trying to park at church on Sunday morning trying to drive through New Market Square at Christmas and you're, you're losing your freak out point. But Jesus, that's not where he hits it. He endured everything except for this. And we take note because we know that we weren't designed for it either. That God created you to walk with you, to spend every day with you. Now, because of Jesus, he actually lives inside of you if you only believe. It's the, that's the good news of the gospel. Pilate saw something that the Jews failed to see. He knew something that the Jew, Jews refused to know, even though they were told. In John chapter 19, verse 13, it says, when Pilate heard, them say, when Pilate heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, out and sat down in the judgment seat at the place that is called the pavement. This is the seat of judgment that Pilate so often judged people from. Now in the, it was the preparation day for Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried away, they cried out, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? You see, Pilate knew what they wanted, but he knew what he had to do. He couldn't have spent time with Jesus and not acknowledge Jesus for who he says he is. We all have that moment to see Jesus for who he's proclaimed to be. And Pilate brings Jesus out and he says, behold your king. And they said, crucify him. And he says, you want to crucify your king? I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Pilate one day because it says in the word that if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my father in heaven. Pilate, in the middle of an angry mob, pulls Jesus out and he says, he is who he's proclaimed to be. And they said, crucify him. But Pilate, being the ruler he is, even though he allowed them to do part of God's plan and go through with it, Pilate had a little bit of a shift to what they wanted to do. Now, in verse 19, it says, now Pilate wrote a title and he put it on the cross in the, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You can crucify him, but you can got, not get away from who he is. He wrote this in Latin. He wrote it in Hebrew and he wrote it in Greek. He wrote it in every, every known language near. And he, he said, you can crucify him. And they said, no, 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 you can't put a, that sign up there that says, it needs to say he said he was. And Pilate says this, what I have written, I have written. Who he is, is who I'll proclaim him to be. 
He puts it as big as it is for everybody to see who Jesus truly is. But he's not just the king of the Jews, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's Jesus the victorious. They come back to Pilate one more time. Jesus is crucified, he's brought down, he's buried, and then it hits them. Oh, nuts. So they come back to Pilate, and I can just imagine the voice in which Pilate has probably heard from these guys so many times over his life. And they come back, and he says this. On the next day, this is, math, this is in verse 62, 27. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember while he, being Jesus, was still alive, how the deceiver, that's what they called him, said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until that day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And then they say something that's really interesting. They say, so the last deception would be worse than the first. They knew that if Jesus was to be, even the rumor got out that Jesus rose from the dead, the significance of that would be so much greater that there's nothing that could ever crucify it. There's nothing that, that they, could, they could end Jesus's life, but if Jesus came back from the dead, then it was game over for them. If he is who he proclaimed to be, the resurrection would be worse than we could ever imagine for us. And so Pilate said this, Pilate said, Pilate said to them, verse 65, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went to the tomb and they secured it, sealing the stone and setting the guards. Pilate goes, hey, and I can just imagine, I'm imagining a little bit here, but I imagine if Pilate knows, if he proclaimed Jesus to be who he was, if he was so dead set that he, he didn't even care if a riot started, but he was going to make sure everybody knew who he proclaimed to be. And then they came back and they said, oh, by the way, you may not know this, but he said he's coming back in three days. And Pilate goes, well, you better go lock, lock that sucker up. You, you got guards, I'd put them all there. Because if he is who he says he is, you're going to need them all. So they seal the tomb and they, they, lock, they, 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 they roll a stone over and they put their guards around. But let me tell you, what you seal up stands no chance about uh, when heaven wants to roll back that stone. And I'm telling you, this is for your loved ones that you're praying for. This is for those in here who feel like, man, I'm never going to be a Christian. I'm never going to be a Jesus. I'm never going to be a go to church kind of guy. I'm telling you, what you've decided to, to, to make hard, God can roll away easily. So Pilate, probably messing with him a little bit by now, says, go, seal it up. Let's see what happens. I'm interested in this part of the story. So what happened with that stone that was meant to box Jesus in forever? John chapter 20, verse 1. And I'm so glad that the, I'm so glad that the story doesn't end in Matthew chapter 27. I'm glad there's a chapter 28. In John, John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Very early Sunday morning before sunrise, Mary Magdalene made her way to the tomb. And when she arrived, she discovered that the stone that sealed the entrance to the tomb had been moved away. What was meant to be immovable and what was guarded was rolled away. Matthew chapter 28 says it this way. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. I don't know what John was writing about, but Matthew like got a little bit more of the picture here. Mary went and the stone was rolled away. Matthew's like, can you just tell him everything? Maybe you should focus on the fact that there was an earthquake. And not only that, but there was an angel and the angel was so bright for an angel of the Lord came from heaven, rolled aside the stone and he sat on it. I just love that picture. Heaven came, removed what the world had put in the way of Jesus. And then that, that angel just sat on it and said, there you go, Jesus, on your way. He ain't here anymore. Said that, it said that not only that, but 
His face shone like lightning and the clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear and when they saw him, they fell into a deep faint. Then the angels, if you weren't sleeping, you better, you better act dead. <laughs> then the angels spoke to the woman, don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. And then the, heaven spoke and said this, he isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said it would happen. He said, go, the, 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 the angel instructed him, go, go on your way and, and, and tell the others. And as they're on their way, Jesus appears to them on that road and they fall down and they worship his feet because that's the only thing you can do. Just imagine Mary coming to the tomb filled with grief, her purpose stolen from her. I imagine that she thought that she'd spend the rest of her days ministering at the feet of Jesus that she was going to, whatever, wherever he would go, she would go. And all of a sudden, he was no longer to go with. She was going in grief and going in, in sadness. And she couldn't believe the events that she had just witnessed. How the whole one week they're saying Hosanna and the next week they're saying crucify him. How is this possible? How did we get here so quickly? And she goes expecting to see the the dead body of her savior and instead she sees an angel sitting on the stone that was meant to seal Jesus away forever. And that angel gives her the good news, the news that we all can receive this morning, which is he isn't dead anymore. He's risen and he's alive and he's alive for you and he's alive in you and, and, and all of a sudden he's gonna be with you as you walk. Go tell everybody the very first thing, the very first instruction from heaven when Jesus was, rose was go. Hey, he's not here anymore, so get on your way and start telling people. And on your way to telling people about Jesus, you encounter Jesus. And all you can do is fall at his feet and worship. All you can do is say, every, I don't know what the plan is, Jesus, but I'm in on whatever it is. I don't know where the hope is, but it's in you because you're not dead anymore. Jesus didn't stay dead long, just long enough to capture victory for you and for me. She ran into Jesus the victorious that day. And because of him, we get to run into Jesus the victorious today. Jesus rolled away that stone. Jesus also ripped that veil before this covenant that we have because of Jesus' resurrection, there's the covenant, the, 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 there was the, the covenant where God could tolerate people. And once a year, good men, you had to be cleaned up and perfect. You had to be all your sins confessed and atoned for. And you could enter into the place in which God would dwell. And if you entered into the holiest of holies beyond that veil and you had any sin in you, they had a rope tied to your leg because it was so common for people to be unworthy to be in the presence of God and they would have to be drug out because if they're not worthy nobody's worthy and so beyond that veil is not that it wasn't friendship it was the, the closest that we could get to God and it would pale in comparison to the how we were designed to walk with him every day but he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you even when sin is covering you he's right there with you but because of Jesus and because of the, he carried your, your sins, that veil ripped open and the presence of God was available for everybody from that moment on. You don't have to go to a veil. You don't have to, in the middle of your struggle, Jesus doesn't see you through your sin. He sees you through salvation. God doesn't see you through his sin. He sees you through the righteousness of Christ. This is, well, what, why is Easter such a celebration in this church? Because we're righteous. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of everything that he's done and he's clothed us in righteousness. And because God can look at us and because God can live in us, we can actually do the things we were called to do, created to do. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us and he's making our crooked path straight. 